Uh, there continues to be more exploitation of commercial VPN vulnerabilities, uh, especially by nation state actors. Hey John, sounds like you have an interesting story for us today. Uh, yeah, thanks Tom. So um, this is kind of maybe a little bit of a rehash of things we've talked about towards the last half of 2019. A lot of us are probably familiar, I know we covered it on Threat Track previously, that there's some vulnerabilities in uh, a few different VPN vendors uh, software, such as Pulse Secure, Fortinet, um, I think there's another one in there that they have some uh, vulnerabilities that you know, a lot of people may you know, not be aware of that they have on their uh, corporate environments or otherwise, and uh, they haven't patched for them. So this uh, article is kind of talking about, you know, we, we had seen last year that there are various actor groups uh, poking around and trying to exploit those various VPN, vulnerable VPN pieces of software. And this one is a report from ClearSky who uh, did a pretty detailed analysis where they've attributed um, a set of activity. There's a bunch of different actor groups targeting this. So I don't want to say this is just the one group, but they have identified there's at least a pocket of Iranian actors, nation state Iran actors, targeting these as well for the purposes of infiltrating uh, organizations, exfiltrating data, and then maybe getting some persistence so that they could do something later in the future if they wanted to. Kind of trying to raise the awareness that we know Iran in the past has gotten into the game of wiper malware and things of that nature. So not saying that's what their motivation is here, but um, something to be concerned about that if you were uh, compromised before you patched your environments, you wanna make sure that there's been no um, persistence mechanism left behind, uh, which may not be trivial to do. I don't have exact information on how you would go about finding that, but you wanna make sure that um, you know, if you did fall into this camp of, oh, I do use Pulse Secure, I have Fortinet, and we had to patch for this problem, you might want to do a little more due diligence just to make sure that you don't have any remnants left behind that left them some ability to maintain access into your internal corporate networks, uh, just in case that um, uh, that scenario arises where they're just laying in wait for something to happen in the future where they want to do something uh, to cause disruption. So it's important uh, that everyone be aware that there are many groups, not just APT groups, are, are targeting these. And if you use VPN services or like stuff with Citrix in any way, you're going to be a constant target of these types of attacks. A couple of other things they mentioned that I thought was interesting is that I think it's, is it APT 34 and 35 they list them as, the two Iranian groups? They noticed that it appears, I don't know how accurate their reporting is, but it appears that there might be, in the past, those actor groups kind of operated independently. And there might be some overlap uh, between them now because there's some shared infrastructure that they used um, in this activity that they were looking at. Uh, so that's interesting as well, because in the past we hadn't seen that before. And then they also said that people should be wary, you know, besides the ones that we knew about from last year, like Fortinet, Pulse Secure, et cetera. Uh, recently, the Citrix vulnerability came out, uh, which is not necessarily VPN, but it kind of is. It's a remote access type of method into your network, potentially, if you use the Citrix um, uh, server software to you know, have some sort of uh, remote desktop capability into parts of your network. Uh, that has a vulnerability that was announced very recently as well. Um, and it looks like that they're starting to um, uh, implement that as well as part of their uh, attack patterns uh, in terms of looking for um, you know, vulnerable hosts. So that'd be something to be worried about. I guess the one thing in terms of recommendations that I was gonna point out is patch. Make sure you're patched. If you can, um, you know, do some analysis to see if you have any sort of strange network activity uh, around those endpoints or anywhere else in your network that might, uh, they, I would read this article because they go into some of the tool sets that they saw them leave behind uh, as well for maintaining persistence. But a couple of other things, especially around VPN that I know personally um, I've seen have a really good return on investment is um, using um, uh, client-side certificates. So a lot of people out there probably have VPN software through various vendors and anybody who has that VPN client 
could connect in, but you can set it up so that you need a client side certificate as well. It's like a mutual TLS authentication. And if you don't have that certificate, uh, you can't connect to that corporate network. So that's a really good mitigation strategy if you're not already using it, as well as you know, multi-factor authentication, which a lot of people already do have some sort of RSA token-based authentication for their VPN, which helps um, you know, make it a little bit more difficult for an adversary to you know, get in when they shouldn't be in there. Yes. So that's, you know, that's all I had on that one, really. I didn't know if you had any thoughts. I guess outbound beaconing, although we know sometimes the C2, uh, like Brian shared with us, can come in, but looking for any kind of like strange anomalous beaconing, going to websites that you don't expect. If you're using a proxy, it would still be good to look at your firewall logs because maybe there's malware that's not like proxy aware that shows you an indication of something is, is wrong. So it's probably like a ton more te techniques, but it's just a few things I kind of thought uh, of when you mentioned you know, looking for anomalous activity. Right, right. This is a, a really interesting uh, piece of research. Um, you know, to speak on the, the attribution overlap between APT 33 and 34, I think you, you mentioned, um, uh, it's, it really kind of speaks to the complexity of the, the intelligence apparatus in that region, uh, the overlap and reuse of infrastructure. Um, kind of goes to show you that you shouldn't, um, you know, just take the general consensus on open source intelligence for who, what adversary does what. So, you know, there's so much behind the scenes that we just don't know at this point, and that overlap really kind of shines a light on that in this case, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I think you corrected me because I think I said 34 and 35, but I think you're probably right that it's 33 and 34. I don't know. It's somewhere in the 30s. <laughs> <laughs> I get them all confused. But um, yes, yeah, I think there's a lot of complexity there um, in. Uh, in trying to do attribution. And I know that, you know, we, in cases we worked, some things line up really well with other people's reports and you're like, yes, that's definitely matches with what we saw somebody else report and they reported it as APT 34. So that's what we'll call it. But, um, you know, I think a lot of these guys also learn from each other and you know, a super savvy nation state could make themselves look like another nation state. And I think we've seen that before as well, you know, where Russia and some other people have tried to look like other actor sets by using their tool sets and techniques um, in their thing. So I'm not saying, you know, nothing's 100 percent, but, you know, they probably there's little um, missteps they made along the way in terms of the bad actors that led them to believe that this is probably the case that, you know, yeah. this is the actor here. So. Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Tom. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. The, the use of potential false flags. But like you mentioned, I think there's a lot of um, you know, growth in terms of trying to acquire infrastructure that's been used by one actor for use in a different actor. That's uh, trying to make that a little bit more complex for defenders trying to do attribution. So, yeah, totally agree with you. Right, right. Okay. Uh, well, that's all I really had on that one. And uh, if you have any of these tool sets like... Citrix or Pulse or Fortinet, you want to make sure that you're patched, um, especially I would say Citrix lately, because that one has been heavily targeted lately. And it's pretty, um, it's pretty low, uh, what do you call that? It doesn't fruit? No, it doesn't require a lot of expertise in order to exploit the Citrix vulnerability, in my opinion. So, um, uh, you know, that's one that probably very easy for, you know, uh, less savvy attackers to exploit. Unfortunately, um, these systems, they give access you know, from external sources right into the core of your network. Um, so it's, it's very serious, to, you, know, you have to protect these uh, uh, endpoints or these, the software or, or these systems uh, very carefully and patching is, is very important. If you haven't patched by this point, then I would be um, recommending that you do a really good scrubbing, scrutinizing of those servers, hardware, um, looking for any artifacts that maybe were compromised because there's more than just this one actor set out there trying to exploit those. 